Y'all stand up and let's worship this evening. Come on, sing. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our Church, glad y'all made it today. I love that line of that song. Is for every fear, there's an empty grave, man. That's a victory. Yeah, I was just reflecting today. I'm just thinking, you know, about uh, you know what we do in worship here, and, and the power that we have uh, with our words, the power that we have our, at our disposal. That one of the things that God gave us when he put us here, is that we have the ability to create an environment. We have the ability to create with just our words. That's how everything was created. And we have that same creative power to create an environment for our spirit, an environment for our heart, an environment for things to change, for an atmosphere to change for us, to shift from doubt to hope and from fear to faith. And so while we're going through this time of worship and singing songs, um, man, I 
I just want to encourage y'all tonight, like, make, make that the thing you do. Whatever it is that you're walking through, we're all just living this life and figuring it out. But tonight, right here in this place, like, we have an opportunity to change the environment, change our circumstances by simply using our voice. And so there's power in that. So I just want to encourage y'all tonight as we sing, go there with us. Go there. Whether that's just in your head, you know, it's just changing those thoughts. Or if it's singing loud, let's do that together. And let's sing about who he is.
you love us through our pain. You love us through our circumstance. So that we can stand on the other side. And we can say, look where our chains are now. God, we celebrate your victory tonight. We thank you for your grace. Worship you. And tonight we just say thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We well, guys can be seated. We're gonna continue in this this time of worship right now. I love getting together every week and being able to do what Bryce said of seeing those words out. <laughs> no matter where we might find ourselves that week, a great week, a difficult week but knowing that sin doesn't have a hold on us. His grace really does truly hold us. It's so encouraging. We're gonna move into this next time where we're gonna have an opportunity to be able to give an offering out of what God's blessed us with. And today I have a little update about some of our close friends who don't live very close. Uh, they're actually in Uganda at God Care School. And just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have heard about our partnership with the God Care School in Uganda? It's awesome, yeah. It's cool because as we have new people join us here across Timber, some people uh, didn't get the opportunity to meet Pastor Dongo. You've heard about our interns in our school of ministry, the Pastor Dongo School of Ministry. And Pastor Dongo was a friend of ours in Uganda. And he was a man who truly left a legacy there as he built the school from elementary kids all the way up. And it's an incredible place where us as a church, we've been able to, to support them, to give, to help build that school, to see them bringing even more kids in off the street, giving them a place to live, giving them a place to learn, but ultimately also giving them a church family there as well. And we were able to give this past summer, our legacy team was able to give a $10,000 gift because the God Cares School is expanding and they needed even more dorms for boys and girls that are coming there. And, we had a team as well that went and visited. They spent some time getting to hang out with the kids. And man, I've had an opportunity myself to go over and visit. And it's so incredible to walk into this complex, to see the school, to see this assembly hall that's been built. It's a massive space in the middle of this small area. And what God Care School does, they've taken this space that so many people have partnered with to be able to, to make happen. And they use that space for themselves, for school and lots of different activities, but they also rent that space out as they're trying to become sustainable. And recently while our, our group was there that was visiting, they had rented out that space to a school, a Muslim school. 
And so they continued to, God Care School continued to have school and they did their chapel in a different area. But what happened was there was a young girl who snuck out of the, the Muslim school's assembly. She made her way into the back of the chapel of God Care School where their chaplain was preaching the same message he preaches every week of hope and grace, of the blessing that it is to be a part of God's family, of the sacrifice that Jesus did, that he paid the price for us, that we could be welcome to this big family. And that young lady gave her life to Jesus right there, skipped out of the Muslim school assembly to say, that's the God I wanna follow. And I think about this as we sit here today in Denton, Texas, and as we have this opportunity to give, whether it's a lot or it's a little, the truth is you are impacting kids that you probably will never meet across the world. But I want you to think about that young lady. I want you to think about the hope that she has heard. I want you to think about the people who live in the same community as her, who have been able to surround her and help her as she takes these steps and learning what it looks like to follow Jesus. And I want you to think about the environment she's in. Think about the school that she goes to. Think about the people that she's around that she can bring hope to now because people like us in a faraway place said, I wanna be a part. I wanna accept the invitation to give part of my life away that it might bless those that I might never meet. This is the opportunity that we have together as a church. This is the opportunity that we're invited into when we spend time worshiping, serving, giving, whether it's of our finances, of our time, whatever God has blessed us with, we are gonna change the world. We're also gonna change our community right here as well. If you don't mind bowing your head, I wanna pray over our offering and then we're gonna continue with our service. God, I thank you so much for our friends in Uganda. I thank you for the Dongo family and everything that they've done to sacrifice for their community. They've been our family even here. And Lord, as they continue to pray for us tonight, Lord, we pray for them that you would bless everything that's happening in those walls, bless everything that's happening in God Care School, bless everything that's happening in that assembly hall. Continue to open doors for them. Continue to make them a light in their community. And Lord, bless this offering. May it continue to bring these stories of people learning who you are, trusting you, and following you, God, in the path that you have for them. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you were a kid, you would have done anything to spend more time with your friends. But priorities change, and eventually it feels safer to be alone. Which seems to work until life happens. The comfort you find in isolating yourself is gone. It's suffocating. You don't think you need others until you do. Finding meaningful relationships isn't easy. But who said anything worthwhile would be easy? It doesn't matter where you meet. It matters that you're present. Why walk alone when there are people that need you just as much as you need them? Get out there. Find the people who bring out the best in you. You will never regret choosing community over isolation. It won't be easy. It's just better.
Well, hey, everybody, how are you? If you haven't been able to be with us over the last couple of weeks, we have been in the middle of a discovery together that one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit in the life of everyone who follows Jesus at whatever level you follow is to help you discover your purpose, your calling on this planet. We learned that really the answer to most of the some of the greatest challenges that almost all of us face, being overwhelmed, weary, stressed, uh, some of the battles that keep us up at night, that we've been led to believe that those are all pace issues. But what we're learning is it's really much more than a pace issue. At its core, it's a purpose issue. And that one of the things that Jesus is inviting us to is a, a life of purpose, that when he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burned out on religion, come to me, I'll I'll, uh, I'll help you get your life back, that what he's calling us to, what he's inviting us to is a life of purpose. And so in this third week, talking about purpose, you know, we learned last weekend, it's that your purpose is about, it's not about being in a different place, it's about being a bridge where you are, right? You know, that, that our call is no matter where we find ourselves in life, what station in life, that all of us can be a bridge to the love of God, but we have to work against being a barrier, right? And so everybody nods, everybody amens, everybody, that's right. Here's the question. So, like, why do we find ourselves settling for less than God's purpose in our lives? Right? Am I the only one? That you look up, you know? I mean, life is a series of mid-course corrections, and you would think if this was so true, and I believe it is, and that if this was our heart, why, 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 why don't we live this way? And I promised you last weekend, if you were here, that I would show you from this story, this story of, in the book of Acts of what a life with the Holy Spirit looks like, I would show you what the number one threat to living your life of purpose is, and it's probably not what you think it is. So I want to, before we get into what it really is, I want to I share with you what I think to be one of the most interesting passages in the book of Acts. Let me give you a little context. Paul is headed into the richest city in the world. It's a city called Ephesus. This is where he's heading. He's taking the good news of Jesus, the gospel invitation of Jesus into Ephesus. It's one of the few cities in the world at this time when he goes in that's multi-ethnic. It's uh, very cosmopolitan. Uh, There was a temple there that was a part of the seven wonders. It's a part of the seven wonders of the world. It's four times as large uh, as any other temple on the planet. It's bigger than the Pantheon in Rome, if that gives you any kind of if you know what that is, that's the famous place in Rome. Everybody takes a picture. This place is four times. And it was so big because in the middle of it, there was a goddess. Her name was Artemis. Everybody say Artemis. Artemis. Her nickname was Diana. Uh, cue the Michael Jackson song right here. But Artemis, she's carved out of, check this out, a meteor that has fallen from the sky. And she is known to the people of Ephesus as the protector of the city. Uh, She is in the center of their existence. This idol is kind of the hub around which this whole city runs. And the Bible tells us that God is doing extraordinary miracles through Paul. Verse 11 of Acts 19. I love this. Even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. So if you've ever turned on like religious TV... And some dude's trying to sell you a handkerchief, you know, for $25, you got an anointing. And you go, that's weird. Where'd that came from? It come from here. They're, Trust me, do not send them your money. <laughs> but this anointing is on Paul, and he comes into the city, and these, these people, he's casting out demons in the name of Jesus is what the Bible says. So some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen this in the New Testament, right? I mean, you've got people in the days of Jesus, when Jesus is alive, and they're 
they're trying to get some of his anointing and the disciples say, hey, they're preaching in your name. And he says, hey, whoever's for us isn't against us, right? And these guys are doing this here and they're, they're trying to copy the power of Paul. And so there's these, uh, these seven ghostbusters, if you will. I mean, you see, it's these, these seven sons of, I can't even pronounce the word, of, these, of, of Skeva, a Jewish priest. There are these seven guys that are going out and they're trying to use the name of Jesus to cast out demons. And one day the evil spirit answered them like the ultimate diss, right? Jesus I know and I know about Paul, but who are you? They don't even know who they are. No recognition of them. And so the man who had the evil spirit that they've been trying to call out jumped on them and overpowered them all. Now listen to this. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. He literally beat the pants off of them. So when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to about 50,000 drachmas. That's $7 million. Okay, we'll get to this in a moment. Everybody look at me. These are believers. He's not talking about pagans. He's talking about believers. There were those who confessed Jesus to be Lord. When they saw this happen, they come and they, and they burn these scrolls up, upward of $7 million dollars that has in them the incantations to Artemis. Trying to invoke the power of the little G gods. And it says in verse 29, In this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So let's pray and we'll get into it. Well, I'm grateful that we see in your word how powerful the name of Jesus is. And yet I'm sobered by the fact that there are those in this story who, who know who Jesus is and yet will settle for something less. And so, Lord, would you teach us even this day a better way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's start this way. Uh, let's start in, in the natural, in this world in which we live, things we can see and taste and feel and touch. Can we all agree that there are good things and bad things? Can we all agree? Good and bad, right? Can we agree that sometimes good things can turn into bad things? Okay, so I'm just thinking about my life. Uh, and so I, I brought a couple of illustrations of this today. When good things become bad things, let's start where if you know me, we're going to start. Let me tell you something. That right there is a good thing. Come on, somebody. They're going to serve Cheetos on, at the banquet table. It's, these were created on the 8th. That there's nothing in the world I like snack-wise other than Cheetos. And so, like, don't feel guilty if you got your little snack bag of Cheetos and you're going to eat them. Let me tell you. Here's the danger in these Cheetos for me is a good thing can turn into a bad thing, right? Like a lot of times the only reason I can't eat these is because I can't stop. So I understand that a good thing for me in moderation can become a really bad thing. You with me? Uh, like I'll use a non-threatening example for all of us. Like you come home from a hard day of work. And you have a little dinner, and you're, it's 9 o'clock. I don't know, some of us, we're not in bed yet at 9 o'clock, and your stomach's rumbling a little bit, and you're a little stressed about the next day, and so you just want to take the edge off, so you get you just a little handful, right? Right, so this, this is a good thing, right? You, you know, anybody know what I'm about to pull out of here? This is where it leads to, right? If I'm not careful, a good thing can become a bad thing. Uh, and you go, well, that's kind of silly, but many of you have been taught that life is about choosing in between good and bad. In fact, not in the natural, but in religious circles, many of us have been taught that there are things that are inherently bad, and yet we're drawn toward them. We feel like they're good. Because we misunderstand the fact that in and of itself, 
It's not what God's created that's bad. It's the pull of what God has created of something good that can become something bad. You're with me? I'm not talking about when good things become bad. I'm talking about when good things become God. When things that God has created for us to enjoy begin to control our lives. It's when a good thing, look at me everybody, becomes the ultimate thing for us. There's a Bible word for it. It's maybe a word that you think does not apply to you. I got 24 minutes to help you understand that this is a common struggle. It sounds very religious to many of you, but there's a Bible word for it. You know what it is? It's the word idolatry. The greatest threat to you living out your calling to living with purpose is one of the great themes of the Bible. It's allowing something to take the place of God in your life. It's not about good things becoming bad. It's not this simple little silly illustration. It's about good things becoming God. And from Genesis to Revelation, many scholars would argue that the greatest theme of the Bible is the theme of God's people returning to God and breaking, casting down, if you will, on a regular basis, releasing the need to allow something else to sit on the throne of their life. It's... I don't know about you, but like in 2019 suburbia where we all live, like that seems to be a foreign concept when I say the word idolatry, right? I mean, I've been in third world countries. I've been through the streets where the little temples are. But for most of us, like you say idolatry and everybody thinks Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, all right? Or if you're like me, the reason I get so emphatic about good not being good and bad is because when I was a kid, somewhere I was led to believe like the desire to be successful in life was inherently bad. There's nothing wrong with being successful. That the desire to have a nice place to live, a nice car to drive, to, to move up the ladder in whatever my chosen, chosen field, that, that uh, like the desire to enjoy my life. Like the, there was something carnal about that, something sinful about that. That, and so I spent a lot of my life feeling guilty for wanting the very best for my life. I misunderstood the concept. Somewhere along the way, I confused good things and bad things with the concept of letting good things become God things. All right? So it, it's the problem is... There's nothing wrong with wanting a house. Mike and I just got finished building a house, rebuilding a house, and we're very excited about it. We've cried several times just standing there looking out and just thanking the Lord for what we have. There's nothing wrong with wanting a house until the house that I am supposed to own starts owning me. You with me? That when desires for, for, for power, prestige, success, pick your word, when, for security, when, when those things become non-negotiables in my life. In other words, God, you've got to do this for me in this way for me to fully release myself to you. I find myself on the streets of Ephesus doing battle with the same battle that these people are doing. And I think many times what keeps you and me from fully releasing into our God-given purpose is we're scared that if we get too close, God may ask us to give up something that we're needing to feel good about ourselves. I mean, come on now. This ain't like happy, happy hour, but you know it's true. This, the fact of the matter is 
One of the most dangerous places you can find yourself is a place that Jesus found in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, hey, don't, I'm, I'm asking you, don't make me do this. But not what I want, but what you want. And for many of us, The realization that something that God wants to give us that's really good has become very bad because it has become the ultimate thing in our lives. Like, I need you to hear me because I just for the sake of emails, just I want you to hear me. Like, dreams are really good. I'm I'm not an anti-dream guy. I just think there's too many of us. Like, we're confusing our dream board with our destiny. And we wonder why we're not happier, why we're not more fulfilled. Is because the creator of the earth ultimately did not create you to give you something, but to make you something. And all of that that he gives you is like fringe benefits. It's not the point. And it's why our lives don't make sense. It's why we're so frustrated. Is because somewhere along the way, we thought that the goal of God in heaven was to make us healthy, wealthy, and wise. When what he's inviting you into is a relationship that brings more fulfillment than anything that I'm giving my life to. Not bad things. Right? Like, turn to your neighbor right now and say this. My child is not going to, it's probably not going to be a professional athlete. Tell, just tell your neighbor that. Like, this will set some of you parents and young kids free. Like, your whole world does not have to revolve around youth leagues and youth sports. And, like, that doesn't have to become the center of your world. You don't have to relive your athletic history through your kid. Like, having children is a great blessing from God. Allowing your children to sit on the throne and control your home and your family is one of the worst things you could do for them, and it will cost you your heart before it's over. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Like, I love my wife. I am grateful for her. I'm not saying it because she's sitting in the room. Lots of you know me away from her. I am, I am grateful for her. She makes a terrible God. She's an unbelievable wife, but she is not my strength. He is, right? And some of you, you've lost mates uh, to death, to divorce. You've gone through these awful things. And there's a part of you, for, like people look at you and go, how do you keep going? You keep going because as much as you grieve that loss, the ultimate goal is not that marriage. The ultimate goal is finding your fulfillment in God alone. You can, like, you can be complete and never find the one. It doesn't mean you have to like it, right? Amen. But it's like all of a sudden, now I'm not putting conditions on God. God, if you're really here, fix my marriage. Bring me a, a new partner. You know, whatever. That in and of itself, that's when good things become God things. And we begin to lose our way. Like, this is the challenge of the culture in which we live. And so, with all of that said, I want to show you from the rest of this chapter, you see what's happening. We got the seven, we got the demons, and we got the hankies, and we got basically Paul going in and challenging Artemis, this God, the center of the city. I want you to, I'm going to show you just quickly, let me show you what happens, what can happen. What the power is in these idols that get set up in our heart. Now remember, idols, are, they're not the thing. They're the way our heart feels about the thing, right? Like my problem is not my wife being an awesome wife. My problem is when I'm expecting her to do something that only God can do in my life. Right? So listen to this. It says, about that time there, was a great, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, men, you, have, you know we received a good income from this business, right? So you got this huge temple. And again, if you've ever been to Cowboy Stadium, it ain't just about the stadium. It's about all the stuff going on around the stadium, right? 
So, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, don't even make, just keep your emotional self. I'm not even making that parallel. I'm just saying if you've been to some big area where lots of people gather, it's not just about the area. It's about the area around. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Right? And so what's happening is if the idol goes, everything goes for these people. Their, their idol is being threatened. The center of their existence is being threatened. And so you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of their people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. By the way, like evidently this has become his slogan. What Paul is saying everywhere he goes is man-made gods are no gods at all. Man-made gods are no gods at all. What does he mean by that? We'll get to it in just a moment. There's danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. He's threatening our idol. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in uproar. The people seized Gaius, and this other guy, I can't say his name, Paul's traveling companion, and they rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. If you kept reading, he said, because this riot broke out. This riot breaks out. So what can we learn from this story about our lives? Like, can we look in a mirror? And can we see some things about idols, the, one, the battles we face, like some truths about it, and, and be better equipped to find our way out? N- number one, write this down, that idols always promise something that they cannot deliver. All right? Like, the irony in this story is that this riot is all about them protecting their, their God. Isn't God supposed to protect you? There's this sense of security that idols bring you. It's why you spend money you don't have on things you don't need to impress people you don't even like. Right? Why? Because at some level, you believe it will provide something to you. Joy, happiness, security. Pick pick your thing. Again, there's nothing wrong in the thing. It's what you're expecting the thing to bring you where you find yourself in trouble. And what what we've got to understand is what we see in this story is idols, they never deliver what they promise. That's why Paul's going to go on later in Romans 5 and say this, the wages of sin is death. And we we miss that wages. You know what that word means? It means substitute pay. It means choosing anything other than God, missing the mark, That what is offered to you is always substitute pay. You never get to see the end result. That, you know, my my mentor, he used to preach on this passage all the time about the wages of sin being death. And this was back in in the 80s. And he would talk about how, man, when are they ever going to make the beer commercial where where the guys, you know, throwing up at 3 o'clock in the morning on his nightstand and, and, and getting taken away in handcuffs and then, you know, being sentenced to six. They never show that. It's all, you know, around the campfire and everybody's happy. Why? Because substitute pay. And here's the crazy thing about it. When I make expectations of a good thing to provide something that only God can provide, guess what? the good thing becomes a bad thing. Like, the greatest challenges in my, in, my, in my 34, almost 34 years now being married has been, when you step back and analyze it, like, the damage to our relationship was done because one of us was expecting the other one to provide something that only God could provide. And sometimes... God's greatest gift is to take away the very thing that you're asking for so that you'll find out that he's enough. Amen. You with me? But idols, they promise something they cannot deliver. And your idols always need protection. 
Like you've always got to be the protecting when you're in an, me and an idol kind of relationship. You, you like, you've got to manage your relationships carefully. If like your idol is, I need everybody to like me, then I've got to. I can't say what I really think. I got to say what I think you want me to say so that you'll like me more. Right? Like if. If your dream as a businesswoman or a businessman, like if your idol is the feeling of reaching the top, whatever that is, then you'll choose things that would never be at the top of your priority list to protect that dream. You'll, you'll... You'll go to crazy, amazing lengths of years of not spending quality time with your kids. Something you said you'd never do. (laughs) Right? I was reading the paper just this past week about this father and son here in the Metroplex area that were caught with this hearing aid scam over millions of dollars where they had this scam set up. People would come in for a free hearing test and get like a coupon or something, and they were sending it in and getting the Medicare for it. And this father and his son are going to go spend, I don't know, lots of years in prison, and you read about it and you go, well, that daddy held that little boy (laughs) when he was born. He didn't look at him and say, one day we're going to go to the penitentiary together. Right? So, so what happened? Somewhere along the way, this need for filling the blank caused him to protect that dream at all costs, and he did the unthinkable. They always need protection, our dreams, our, our, uh, our idols. Don't miss this. One of the ways that you know that you're battling this idolatry thing is there's a huge level of emotion about something that you shouldn't be that emotional about. I was talking to Jamie Mullins about this a couple of days ago. We were, I was texting back and forth with her about this weekend's message, and I was, I was telling her that, I, that and if you're going to write anything down, you hear me say today, write this down. Your I, idolatry issue is always tied to your identity issue. Always. See, I'm told as a kid, hey, that's an idol. That's bad. You need to break that idol. The question is, why am I worshiping in the first place? Because I have an identity issue in that area of my life. She said, well, that's, she's texting me. She goes, well, I agree with that 100%, but how in the world do you get that out of that text? I said, it's the riot. The, the riot doesn't break out because of a theological debate. The riot breaks out because their power their, is being threatened. You know, every... War in the history of the world has been about power. Never been about territory. It's been about territory represents, right? It's about power. Who's going to be in power? Another word for that is control. Like the need to control that I battle on a regular basis at its core is an idolatry issue about because my idol is power. Why? Because I find my identity in things going well for me. If things are going well, I'm doing well. And if things aren't going well, then there must be something wrong with me. And the, 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 the inability to forgive somebody else. Is at its core a power issue that is at its core related to, uh, related to an identity issue. There is a reason that idolatry begins with the letters I-D. And as long as I don't know who I 
I am in Christ, as long as I'm tr- I have something to prove and something to hide, I will always lose a battle with my idols. I will need something else to say to my world and to me that I am enough. And this riot breaks out. There's this passion that raises up. You know, let me tell you, 20 years in January that I've stood on this stage and taught this church family. You know the one topic that has raised the most emotion, negative emotion in people over the last 20 years? Anybody got an idea? Yell it out wherever you're sitting, whatever campus. What do you think it is? It's money. It's money. I can talk to you about anything, most of you. But I'll start talking about money, about you being obedient to God in your finances. And, man, it gets raised up all over the place. My motives get questioned. People start, you know, revisionist history. You always use these absolute statements. Well, while you're judging me, well, here's what you're really trying to do. And there, there's a part of me for so many years in ministry that would go, why are you so mad about that? I mean, just teaching the Bible, why? Because it's a big idol <laughs> that causes great emotion to come up in our hearts. It, they, they produce unbelievable passion. But here's the thing. Like, idols are never satisfied. It's never enough. Like, pastors like me, guys that are my friends in ministry, and I'm talking about like these level 10 friends where we tell each other what we're really thinking, not what we think everybody wants to hear, just thinking we're together. Like, our, our greatest idol is success. We want to be successful, and we can rationalize it away because it's for the kingdom. It's for God. I mean, I'm just being honest. I mean, that, and here's what happens. Here, here's, how, here's how I know that, uh, that I'm battling the idol. Not that I care, but I start caring way too much about what you think. And I've said to young guys for years, I've said this. I said, like if you bow your knee to that idol of success, whatever, however you define it, you're only as good as your last sermon. It's, it's never good enough. And we lie to ourselves as pastors. Well, as soon as we achieve this, as soon as we get over this hump, as soon as we're able to grow to this point, as soon as we're able to do this. I don't think we're alone. I think some of you truly believe that if you just get over this financial hump, if you could just get this deal closed, if you just get this done, And the, the fact of the matter is, like, if you don't break your idols, your idols will break you. Because they demand to be satisfied over and over and over again. Like, if you don't deal with your idols, your idols will deal with you. If you can't get past the place of saying, well, what's wrong with fill in the blank and do the hard work of understanding what is driving you? So hard for fill in the blank so that you might be whole, complete, enough, happy, fill in the word. Until you do the hard work of asking yourself that question. You're going to be in an arm wrestling match with yourself. You're just going to be 
trying harder. It's, it's why I use this silly thing to start with. <laughs> it's, I mean, you see, I see this in my life. You see it in your life. It's like, like the harder you try, I'm just, I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to do that. What happens? What do you do? I'm not going to eat any more chocolate cake. I'm not going to eat any more chocolate cake. And you look up and your face is in the middle of the chocolate cake. <laughs> All right? Look at me. Some of you are frustrated because you're trying so hard to move away from something. God is trying to get you to move toward something. What's he trying to get to, you to move toward? The gospel. The person, the only person who is not demanding for you to be performing, but is inviting you to be transformed. I mean, the gospel answers every battle that we have with our idols. An idol demands a sacrifice. The gospel said God sacrificed so you wouldn't have to perform. An idol says it's, it's more, more, more. Another sacrifice, another day, another dollar, another this, another that. The gospel says it's finished. <laughs> Your idol pushes you to protect at all cost. Protect that relationship. Protect your reputation. I mean, why do you think we talk so much around here about living an authentic life, about being vulnerable? Why is that such a value around here? Why? Because the natural tendency of all of us is to spend our energy trying to fool other people into believing that we're somewhere we're not. And there's no healing in that. At its core, it's protectionism, which at its core... It's idolatry. And Jesus says, come, come to me. I'll protect you. I'll be your defender. I'll even take the stuff that scares you the most. And I'll leverage it for your good so that you might be fulfilled and Everything I've created for you to do. It's like the answer is not to put away your idols. The answer is to move toward the only thing that's driving your heart toward the idols in the first place. So, I've just, I'm going to pray for us. And before I do, I'm, I'm just going to ask you to do one little exercise. You know, I'm a little ahead of you guys, right? Like, I've been studying and thinking about this the first time you've heard me talk about it. I told our teaching, young teachers this week, we were meeting, I said, I, I've had my heart broken on this issue. I mean, like, it's broken my heart. Not, not like I'm pitiful, but just like in reality, like this battle, man. Like, God just shows me places. You're trusting her for stuff you need to be trusting me for. You need to quit, quit put conditions on your happiness. And so I asked the Lord a question for me. It's like, man, my heart is deceptive above all things. I got blind spots. God, would you show me, like, where my idols are? And he just asked me one question. And I've been, I ain't told you this, Micah. <laughs> it's been too personal. But I've just been, he asked me one question that I've been asking myself for the last three weeks. And I've gotten a little piece of paper out and I've started listing when I feel prompted. I mean, maybe it's me, maybe it's bad pizza, but I'm asking God, so I'm just going to trust this God. 
He asked me this question. He said, what keeps you up at night? And so I've just been writing down for three weeks things that keep me up at night. You know, you start in general topics, and then you got to get, after a while, you got to get specific. And I'm, I'm just asking you to join me in this process. Like, if you want like, transformation, not just information, I dare you <laughs> to get a piece of paper and to say, Lord, would you show me what keeps me up at night? And just... And God will start revealing places. I don't think it's the only question, but I think it's a really good question. And then I have a really dear friend that had no idea that I was in the middle of this exercise. He was in the middle of a challenging business season. And he said to me, it's okay, I'm going over a little and telling you all this. It's important, I think. He said, he was, he's in a challenging business season, and he said to me, you know, when I, I've been finding myself waking up at 2.30 and 3 in the morning, and this challenge, and this challenge, and this challenge, and I start what if in this, and worst case scenario, I know none of y'all do this, but like worst case, case scenario in this, and how am I going to fix this? And he said, so I, he got, I do two things. Number one, I get up and I start dealing with the facts. My mind's going to all these things, so I'll just start writing that facts. But he said, the only thing that has helped me so far is I speak the word out loud, Messiah. Not Jesus, not say, I speak the word Messiah. And I said to him later, I said, well, and again, I didn't tell him any of this. I told him this. Well, I think God is urging you to call him Messiah because he wants to teach you how to live an idol free life and so what if this week you had the courage to say hey God what keeps me up at night and begin the process even when you don't feel like it yet to say God I'm giving that to you You're enough for me. Let's watch God begin to remove the barriers that keep us from moving out into our calling. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for a new identity in Jesus. That we are who he says that we are. Not who an ex-spouse says that we are. Not who an absentee father, a, a an angry employee, an overbearing employer. We're not who those people say that we are. We are who you say that we are. And I thank you for a new identity in Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for an invitation to be transformed because the performing thing is not working for us too well. And I'm grateful, Lord, most of all, that in you we find every good and perfect thing. That what our heart longs for is found in you. And so, Lord, would you release us to enjoy (laughs) the blessings that you bring our way? I mean, I just, in Jesus' name, speak against guilt and condemnation for your success. I just pray, Lord, we never confuse the gift with the giver. And I thank you, Lord, for the calling represented in our lives this day. And may it be said of us that we sold out to your kingdom because we were filled with your power. And it brought you much glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I think about doing that exercise, I don't want to, but I guess I will. A lot of fun. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's really fun. Toby said it's a lot of fun. Then you stay up at night thinking about what you are up at night about. Perfect. 
When I think about that, I think it's ultimately probably going to lead us back to what Toby said there. The most important thing he said today is that those idolatry issues are tied to our identity issues. And it's all going to go back to, of course, like none of this is fun at all. But the truth is, I think when we get to that place and we start to see that, we can start take to start to take some next steps to figure out, okay, who is it that I really am then? Who is it that God says I am? And we explore this in step one of our pathway. Our, our purpose here at Cross Timbers is that we all follow Jesus, find freedom, have someone to know something to do. And part of being able to find freedom is figuring out truly who you really are, who I really am. It's not what a parent or a coach said. It's not what a boss has said about us. It's not even what our spouse says, all the good things that they might say about us or a friend. It's how God sees us. And so if you've never attended one of our Pathway workshops, it's two steps, and we'll actually start up again next Sunday, September 1st. And I want to invite you to come be a part of that because, as Toby mentioned, this identity thing in us, it's going to help us to learn what those idols are, how to break them, and how to start living out, not off of just our dreams, but the destiny that God has for each of us. And thank you for choosing to be here together tonight. If you need an opportunity to pray with someone, we're going to have some folks down here that would love to have a chance to pray with you before you leave. And if you're new here, uh, we'd love a chance to shake your hand before you leave. There's a new here banner right there in the back corner. We're going to have some people there that would like to meet you. And, and I hope you guys have a great weekend. And I look forward to hearing some of those things that keep you up at night. We'll get to do that together. Have a great week.